Hello. Um, so this is the other side of the story. You don't have to look at your data. Let the algorithms do it. <laughs> but no, it, it'll be complementary, I think, to what we just saw. Um, I'm a data scientist at Nextera Energy up in Juneau Beach, but this is totally unrelated to any of that. So. And in fact, uh, this isn't even my own work, so I want to make it very clear to begin with that uh, I stole everything, and I want to give most of the gratitude to the Auto ML Group at University of Freiburg in Germany, um, where these top three authors uh, wrote the main paper I'll be um, highlighting, and I think these bottom two guys worked together on the first chapter of this book that I'm stealing a lot of stuff from, too, but they're all in the same research group. Um, so what is hyperparameter optimization? Let's just be clear about that before we get going on how to do it. Um, so most ML algorithms have something that needs to be specified before you can actually feed it data and let it start learning, right? So these things that have to be specified up front are hyperparameters. And even if you aren't specifying them, they're usually there. They're just maybe set to default, right? So using an algorithm to choose those hyperparameters is then hyperparameter optimization or HPO. Um, just to kind of put this into context, there's something kind of more inclusive called auto ML, where you would then be automatically searching through what algorithm to use, pre-processing, feature engineering, feature selection, tuning the hyperparameters, maybe ensembling a whole variety of these models, and it's kind of like a automated data science in general, right? And so I'm just going to be focusing on hyperparameter optimization and leave the rest of that out. Um, it's kind of debatable on if you want to include pre-processing as a hyperparameter or not. So if you have a neural network, maybe whether or not you uh, do ZCA on the images before you feed them into the algorithm could be a Boolean hyperparameter or something. But uh, So why HPL? I think the most obvious answer is if you choose good hyperparameters, you'll get better model performance, right? So that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, default settings will usually give some sort of result, but they're really not your friend, OK? And they won't get their feelings hurt if you decide to change them. Um, and no, there is not one learning rate to rule them all, although everyone has their favorite to start with, right? Um, but I think kind of a more overlooked reason to do HPO is the second one that if you're trying to make uh, valid comparisons between different models for the same data set, it's totally unfair and invalid to compare the algorithms unless you spend equal amount of effort or computational resources tuning the hyperparameters, right? So it wouldn't be uncommon to say, oh, I've got this great new algorithm. It works so great. I tune the crap out of it on this data set. It gives me excellent. And look, it beats that, that, and that because I left them on their default settings, right? So I think it's really important, uh, especially if you're doing research, to use hyperparameter optimization to make fair comparisons. Okay, um, Many people manually tune hyperparameters. I know. I've been there. Um, but would you ever manually tune your regression coefficients just looking at the validation score until you think you found the best coefficients for your regression model? Right? Even if you're really good at it, like, oh, I've been doing this a long time. I'm really good at it. No, right? That sounds crazy when you put it like that. Um, I'd also like to highlight something called variable ratio, variable ratio reinforcement schedules. Um, this is what casinos use to get you to addicted to slot machines, right? If a reward um, might or might not happen on the next pull, and uh, you go kind of long droughts in between pulls that offer you a reward, in this case, finding hyperparameters that worked the best so far, it's an excellent way to make you keep pulling that lever. Right? So I don't know about you, but you know, you've got your data set pre-processed, all ready to go. Pick your favorite algorithm. Start with a set of hyperparameters. Let it run. Watch the validation scores go by, especially if it only takes a minute or two. Right? Then say, oh, I'll tweak it this way. Do it again. Tweak it this way. Oh, it got better. Do it again. Oh, it got better. Do it again. Right? It's, uh, before you know it, an hour or two has gone by, and you've just sat there manually tuning. Um, in grad school, we used to refer to graduate student descent when you just have a professor tell the grad student to go tune the algorithm for him. Um, but we're doing data science here. So if we're trying to tune something, we should use an algorithm, right? So take the time to learn a good open source library for hyperparameter optimization and never go back to the casino, 
Okay? Really, the biggest barrier is that finding a good open source library in the past has been non-trivial, or one that has continuous support. There's been some around for a long time, but they kind of stopped being maintained or whatnot. So I'll highlight one at the end of this talk here. So a formal kind of problem formulation here. Um, HPO is a hard problem because we're essentially optimizing a black box where the domain is our hyperparameter configuration space. Our range is a real number, which we would want to make it be like our model's generalizability or uh, test set performance. So we're mapping from hyperparameters to test set performance. The only problem is this black box function is very expensive to evaluate, because to evaluate it, we have to train a model. Right? So some deep learning models, this could be hours or days. I think uh, Google's BERT model took something like a year's worth of V100 time to train. So um, the other problem is that it's a noisy function evaluation. So remember, we're trying to get the best test set performance. And we can only approximate that with validation set performance. And that's noisy, right? Because you get a different validation set, you'll get a different score. And it's you know, some unbiased estimator of the test set performance in theory, right? Another thing that's hard about it is, in general, you can't back prop through training a model. Although there was one paper I saw that did manage to approximate that somehow. That was pretty cool. But uh, in general, you have no gradient information in this optimization, right? So what makes a good HPO algorithm? So first off, it has to be flexible enough to accommodate your hyperparameter space. So you will have some real valued hyperparameters, some integers, some categorical variables. Um, conditional variables, for instance, whether or not to add a second layer to your net, or whether or not to add that third layer. And then once you add those layers, you have to choose how big they are. So choosing the size of your third layer is only relevant if you have a third layer. Um, or whether or not you're going to use regularization, then what is the regularization coefficient you're going to use, and so on. And then also, it's got to accommodate high dimensional spaces, right? Because in a lot of these more complicated models are getting a lot of hyperparameters now. Um, I've got these two terms kind of sound the same, but I'm going to use them to mean different things. So efficient means that each step of the algorithm has to be computable in a reasonable amount of time, whereas effective means that it takes a fairly small number of steps to uh, get a good answer. Scalable, I really mean scaling out or running in parallel. Robust, uh, this, one's, this one's really important and tricky because it sneaks in. Um, if we're going to use an algorithm to perform an optimization, that algorithm might have some hyperparameters. And you don't want hyper hyperparameters because at some point, the buck stops with you and you've got to set it, right? So robust would mean you want an algorithm that works pretty much out of the box with default parameters on any problem. Okay? Um, and that eventually it will find a good solution, even if you didn't set those hyper, hyper parameters to a good value. And then easy, I think, has probably been the barrier that why everyone is still doing man, or not everyone, why most people still go to manually tune their hyper parameters is because it's not easy to write these things from scratch all by yourself. There's a lot of moving parts, right? So um, really, that comes down to finding something that's already existing and well-maintained and easy to use, getting familiar with it. And then you don't want your algorithm to eat or sleep, right? Seriously, stop going to the casino, right? So the first class of algorithms I'll talk about is model-free methods. So here you're searching over your domain, which, remember, is your hyperparameter configuration space, without ever really trying to model the mapping from that domain to your range of test set performance. So you're searching and getting a value. You use that value to inform your search somewhat, but you're not actually trying to create a model that uh, approximates that function. Right? So the most basic one would be grid search, where you lay a grid over your configuration space and check every point. Don't do that. At minimum, go to random search. There's lots of good theoretical reasons for this. In grid search, you end up repeating the same parameter setting a whole bunch of times. And you'd be better off injecting some random noise around that. So random search is almost, or it is always better than grid search. Don't use grid search. Um, there's heuristic search uh, methods like ant colony optimization and particle swarm optimization. Um, the problem with these methods is they, in general, need a lot of function evaluations, which isn't great when they're very expensive. Right? 
And there's evolutionary algorithms and genetic programming. Again, it can take a lot of function evaluations. Um, I know these are quite popular when you get up to the whole auto ML scheme, though, for like feature engineering, for instance, where you will take different features and combine them in crazy different ways through genetic programming. Um, last class here is multi-resolution algorithms. The idea here is that instead of doing this really expensive evaluation, maybe you can do a cheaper function evaluation but get a noisier answer, right? So this could be like training on only a hundredth of your training data and see how it performed on that. Or instead of doing tenfold cross-validation, just evaluate on one fold and take that validation error and it's 10 times faster, right? But it's going to be a noisier estimate of the actual test set performance. Uh, so we're actually, this hyperband algorithm is going to come into play later. So, um, so in general, model-free methods are flexible uh, because you're usually randomly sampling from the configuration space. Uh, efficient because you don't have to do any complex logic to choose which point you're going to pick next. Scalable because a lot of times it's embarrassingly parallel to do these things. Um, but they're not that effective. In other words, it takes a lot of model evaluation or model training, function evaluations to uh, get a good answer. Right? So this is in contrast to model-based methods, sometimes called Bayesian optimization, uh, where you define a surrogate model that's approximating the function from configuration space into test set performance. Uh, then you use that surrogate model uh, to along with something called an acquisition function to like pick which configuration you're going to try next. So you're explicitly mapping how configuration space results in test set performance, then you're using that model to say um, what, I'm, what you're going to try. So you can have different surrogate models and different acquisition functions for different combinations here. Um, I think the first one that became popular was Gaussian processes, uh, which are nice because they explicitly have um, uncertainty built right into them, and they're smooth and nicely behaved. And, uh, the problem with those were the flexibility part. So it is a little trickier to handle categorical variables. It's very tricky to handle conditional variables in your search space. Uh, one that worked better for that was use a random forest surrogate model, and that results in an algorithm called SMAC, which is also just a cool algorithm name. Um, Bayesian neural networks, I don't know of any implementation out there. I've just heard it mentioned and referred to in other papers, so I wouldn't call it easy because there's nothing to just go pull. And uh, tree structured Parson estimators, which is difficult to just explain on a slide, but the idea is that you're, you've got some kernel de density estimates about where your good points are in hyperparameter space and where your bad points are, and you kind of take a ratio of those um, to inform where you're going to try next. And these are really nice because they are super flexible. You have all the different configuration space options available. And they're also quite uh, efficient, unlike Gaussian processes, which can be like a cubic runtime in the number of points you've tried so far. So once you get up to, I don't know, trying a 1,000 different combinations of hyperparameters, your runtime of actually picking where your next hyperparameter choice you're going to come from is 1,000 cubed, and then you're prohibitive. Uh, TPE, I believe, is linear, so it's very fast to pick your next point. Um, and then your acquisition function, just uh, how you use your surrogate model to pick your next point. We'll just go with ex expected improvement, which is uh, how likely is that next point to yield a result better than the best so far, right? And then the expected value of how much better it is than the best so far. So the first thing I'll kind of go into detail on here uh, is successive halving, and this will feed into hyperband in a moment. Um, so su the idea behind successive halving is you've got some total budget, so that might be like training on the entire training set for 100 epochs or whatever you think your training would uh, normally take. Uh, you pick some large amount of configurations and you start them all off at once for a little while. So say, in this case, you picked eight configurations, and you're going to run them for an eighth of the maximum training time. And once you've done them all up to that point, you throw away a certain proportion of them. So in this graph, uh, you've thrown away these top four, you're throwing away half. And then you run the ones that survived a little longer. And you get to another stopping point, and you throw away the worst half again. 
and then you run a little longer, throw away the next half, and then the one that survived kind of all those tournaments, you keep running out to completion. Right? So you get to try eight different points, and instead of having eight curves going out to 100%, you've saved yourself a lot of computation there. Right? And there's no reason why you would have to run it until there's only one remaining. You know, maybe um, you only do two sets of halving steps, starting with eight, and you end up with two at the end that, for final performance. Right? Now, uh, the problem with this is that there's a trade-off here between uh, how many points you're going to start with and how often you're going to do your cutting. Right? There's a hyper hyper parameter hiding here again. Right? And that makes it not very robust. So sometimes it's good to take a lot of points to start with and a lot of cuts to whittle them down. Sometimes you need to let them run longer to start to differentiate themselves. Or you don't really see which hyperparameter setting is going to be the best until maybe at 50% budget or something like that, in which case you'd be better off uh, letting things run longer before you make your first cut. Right? So, hyper, so that's that not robust part. So hyperband solves this by saying, well, let's just try all the different cuts. Right? So I'll try not cutting it off at all, which is equivalent to random search. You're just picking random points and letting them run to completion. Well, and then on the other end, there's I'll pick a whole bunch of points and cut off it. And then I'll try everything in between and just allocate my resources evenly across that, which kind of seems naive, but it works really well. So I think that paper came out at the end of 2016. It might have been 2017. And it showed really good results, A, because it tries a lot of things fast, and B, because uh, it's very robust to that success of having problem. Uh, however, it's not very effective in the sense that um, it doesn't always get the best answer, because it's um, model-free, and it's still randomly sampling configurations. So how can we bring in that Bayesian optimization and combine it with it? And that's what the paper. Bayesian optimization and hyperband did, which came out in ICML 2018 this year. Um, so they start with vanilla hyperband, but they store all the validation scores for every configuration and budget pair along the way. So remember, like on that first uh, here, so they've got these eight configurations. They'll run them out to this eighth of your budget thing, and they'll store all these values along the way. And then they'll cut these and throw them away, just like in successive having, right? Or in hyperband. Remember, hyperband is just doing successive having with different number of cuts, right? So as you store all these config budget pairs, you can start to build up a Bayesian model about where you should pick next. You start off randomly sampling, but as the da data starts to roll in from trying all these kind of quick and dirty models, you build up a tree parse and estimator to help you pick uh, where you're going to try next. Once you get enough data, you use your tree parse and estimator most of the time. Um, still random sampling once in a while for robustness. Okay? And as hyperband continues, you'll start to get things, uh, more data on the higher budget runs, which are more accurate validation scores. And you switch over to a new tree parse and estimator at a higher budget, and you keep using the highest budget available that you have data for. And uh, this turned out to work really well. It's a little bit difficult to see here, but um, this is from the BOHB paper. Um, BOHB is in green here. Notice the log scale here for wall clock time. Okay, so this is this is a 20 times speed up. That's huge. You start getting excellent performance before they even start returning their first um, values here. Um, and you see hyperband and BOHB are almost right on top of each other, except when you get out here, hyperband stops improving uh, much, whereas BOHB is starting to build up this Bayesian optimization model and then can intelligently choose its next points, whereas hyperband keeps randomly sampling. So you randomly sample at first with quick and dirty models, you start building up your Bayesian stuff, and then you can end up with a 55 times speed up over regular random search. Right. So 55 times speed up on your hyperparameter search isn't a reason to uh, look at this library, then I don't know what is. So the library that this is implemented in is called HP Banster, Hyperban on steroids. Uh, it's very well architected. It's from that same uh, lab in Germany, the AutoML group at Freiburg. Um, it 
just started in 2018 because that's when the paper was published, but it looks like it's going to be very well maintained. So far, it's had a lot of releases and uh, updates, and they're very responsive to GitHub issues. And they've got very nice documentation along with examples, so it's super easy to learn. Okay? Um, very flexible configuration space definition. I'm going to show you that in a second to give you an idea what that looks like. And uh, as far as the architecture goes, you can run it across multiple nodes, right? So you kind of have one node that's your master, the brains. It's doing the configuration selection. So it's, it's building up that tree parse and estimator and deciding what configuration to try next. And then you can have a whole bunch of worker nodes all operating independently, running in parallel, that are taking a configuration and a budget and training the model on that configuration out to that budget. And then this is all orchestrated with some name, name servers and dispatcher stuff to get that uh, multi-node capability. But this could easily run on one machine across different cores as well. Right? Uh, so this is what a configuration for uh, PyTorch ConvNet might look like. So you could say, I've got a learning rate. I specify a lower bound and an upper bound, a starting value, and that is a uh, log transformed so that you're equally as likely to step 10 times higher, 10 times lower, instead of just uh, ignoring the low end range if you didn't do that log transform. Um, you've got categorical hyperparameters, so you can choose between Atom and SGD in this case. We've got uh, a momentum term that you're a uh, uniform distribution over. However, you're only going to use the momentum term if your optimizer is SGD. So that's a condition there, right? So that's a conditional hyperparameter thing. Because Atom, apparently, they're just going to use the default. Um, you've got integer values. Um, integer values that are log space for number of filters. And then you can have greater than conditions as well. So before, we had a Boolean condition, basically. Uh, here, we're saying if you've got more than one convolution layer, you need to specify the number of filters in the second layer. If you've got more than two convolution layers, you need to specify the number of filters in the third layer. Um, yeah, OK. And then this is just, I've showed you one algorithm in one library. There's actually quite a few out there. I would suggest you start with HP Banster, but HyperOpt has been around the longest. That's from about 2011, the original TPE paper. Um, Spearmint is Gaussian processes. SMAC, I mentioned earlier, uses random forest surrogate models. SKOpt, I believe, is Gaussian processes too. But um, SMAC and SKOpt, I think, are actually pretty well maintained as well. SMAC might be at the same lab now in Freeburg. They might have taken it over. Um, there's a commercial company called SIGOpt, where one of the kind of earlier people making a lot of headway on Bayesian optimizations went and started a startup where they have an API where you don't have to submit your data or anything. You basically tell them, these are my hyperparameters, and they'll tell you which ones to try. You train your model, tell them the result, they'll tell you the next one to try. Right? So, and that's all in, in the API gateway. Um, and then if you're interested in like the full AutoML data pipeline thing that I kind of mentioned at the beginning, here's some more libraries to check out. Uh, I just heard an interview with uh, the guy that wrote Teapot on a da the Data Frame podcast. That was very good. Um, looks very interesting. Uh, and then some references and suggested reading if you're interested in this. Um, this book is uh, freely available online right now in draft form, and I'd highly recommend it if you're interested in AutoML. And uh, I've got a few more minutes. I guess I've got like 10 seconds. Let me just say I, I kept kind of referring to deep learning in terms of the early stopping thing and like how, many training how much training data you used. You could do the same thing with validation folds on something like uh, uh, gradient boosting machines as well. Or if you've got small data, you could use the number of validation folds as your kind of budget, whether you're going to go from one fold to 10 folds and so on. So it's really widely apl applicable to that multi-resolution thing. Uh, and that's it. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, have you seen any examples of people using this on like collections of data sets 
because, I don't know, it just would be interesting to see. Um, yeah, so the papers themselves, you know, like to compare different HPO methods on various benchmark data sets. Um, and I know the kind of full-on auto ML stuff, the guy that made Teapot, I, his name's escaping me, was saying that people are, have been throwing it at problems and getting like top 10% on Kaggle just out of the box, and it's surprising a lot of people. So it's, the, these, these things work pretty well. You, some of the, I think the auto ML things, you can get like, one of the papers talks about Frankenstein stacking models. So just very descriptive in terms of what you end up getting out of them, because uh, you think a neural network's hard trying neural networks stacking all these other crazy models with genetic programming for your feature engineering, right? Any more questions? All right, thanks, Dan. Yep.